so within this overall story and what we see as an evolution towards a larger embrace of political goals and politically smart methods, um, there's at least five core issues um, that we want to highlight. The first is this continuing division between the instrumental and the intrinsic justifications for political goals. So as Tom mentioned, governance and democracy support had quite different origins. Governance came from sort of the economic realization that the state was actually an important actor in development and you needed well-functioning institutions to get socioeconomic development. Whereas democracy support came from the end of the Cold War, the third wave of democracy, the sudden sort of idea that there was a new global consensus around the value of liberal democracy and human rights. And towards the sort of early 2000s, some donors were firmly in the democracy camp, like USAID, though it also has governance divisions. Some, like the World Bank, and for the most part, um, the UK, were more on the governance side, saying, okay, we're not going to make explicit statements about democracy. Um, and then many donors centered, including the EU and UNDP, around the idea of democratic governance, of saying, okay, well, we think effective institutions are important, but we also think that participation, accountability, and transparency are important. They all go together, we'll promote them together. Um, but in a way that never resolved the tension between this instrumental argument and the intrinsic argument. And so there's still ongoing debates about do we support governance, do we support democratic governance because it's a good thing in itself, or because we know it helps and is crucial for socioeconomic outcomes. And if it's the latter, then should be we be rethinking what kind of governance we're promoting. Um, which leads to the second um, major issue <coughs> around the tension sometimes between political goals and politically smart methods. Um, political goals opened the door for political methods in that aid providers realized that they couldn't do things like promote democracy or strengthen local governments or improve public financial management unless they understood the politics behind those issues and unless they understood how to make their aid an effective facilitator of change. And so if you have political goals, you need politically smart methods. But interestingly, moving on politically smart methods doesn't have to lead to political goals and can even lead to a questioning of donor political goals. Um, and David Booth's work has been very important in this regard, in the sense of if we really think about what the smartest way to promote development goals in a society is, we might get answers that are quite different from the democratic governance consensus around accountability and participation and transparency. And then donors have to ask themselves, are we doing this? Are we going to be participatory because we're going to keep saying that it's good for development? Or are we going to be participatory because we really think that that's the best way to operate and for our long-term development goals? It's better to support inclusive processes, even if it might not be as great for our specific program goals. And so there's this real tension between sort of how much do we include political values within the idea of politically smart methods. Um, and that hasn't been acknowledged or dealt with by any of the donors, really, that we studied. Um, and both this issue around ins instrumental and intrinsic goals and around political goals and politically smart methods lead to a further challenge around how to integrate this across development work, because the idea behind both the instrumental case and behind politically smart methods is not just to inform specific programs working on governance, but is to make sure that all assistance, including in health and in agriculture and in transport and in economic growth, are politically informed and are contributing to effective institutions in the country. Um, and while most donors at the policy level say, of course, all of our work works together and supports these ideas, it's very complicated on the operational side to actually make sure that all these programs are reflecting these principles. One, because donors aren't clear exactly what everything should reflect. Should they all be using politically smart methods in the sense of all programs should have a political analysis? Or should they all be committed to certain princ governance principles, like all programs should take a participatory approach? Or 
should it even be more goals oriented and that all programs should be furthering <coughs> sort of prospects for democracy and human rights. And so there's internal debates about what integration means and then also questions about how that would actually work and how do you split budgets between programs and sectors, sort of the bureaucratic obstacles of the fact that practitioners work in their sectors and are accountable to their sector leadership. Um, and so another additional issue, um, which we came across repeatedly looking at sort of the incomplete embrace of political goals and methods, is the sort of technocratic persistence or even the expansion of technocratic ideas into new domains. So when donors first started working on governance, they often came to it with the same technocratic mindset of we're just going to export institutions and train people how to do things right, and that will sort of prevent the judiciary from being corrupt because we'll explain how to run a good anti-corruption program. Um, and even when donors expanded to the citizen side or voice and accountability initiatives or what the World Bank calls the demand side of governance um, in saying what we should really do is empower citizens to press for change. So we're going to have citizen report cards monitoring public services. We're going to have participatory budgeting. We're going to fund NGOs. This was also approached in a fairly technocratic fashion. Of we're going to find the few NGOs that sort of speak the same way we do and can submit budget proposals. And we're going to set up these participatory processes within our programs that are actually going to be quite limited in how much people can really contest um, and voice their opinions on what kind of development they really want. So there was a whole new wave of criticism around that. And now we're thinking of, OK, if we want to take the citizen side seriously, we need to be promoting state society relations, we need to be working with social actors like social movements or trade unions that are really the ones that have political influence in society and are representative, but how do we do that and what's that going to mean for aid mechanisms? And that's definitely still an open debate. And then just finally, um, a fifth issue is the reactions by partner governments and recipient countries um, who often saw this rise of both donor work on political issues and particularly funding for civil society organizations and increased donor analyses and questioning of politics with a good amount of wariness because both they didn't like the fact that donors were now working with other social actors beyond just governments. They didn't like the fact that donors were commissioning analyses which often pointed to corruption and patronage systems and other things. Um, and they were quite unsure about donors' intentions in this regard and whether, why they really wanted to sort of start working on governance. Um, at the same time, some people, others within countries, are quite happy that donors are working with other actors beyond the government. Civil society groups can be quite happy that donors seem finally open to taking their opinions into account. And governments also can be happy that donors and sort of um, partners are coming in with a more realistic understanding of what constraints they face um, and not coming in saying, you know, you need to do this policy reform, we know it's best, um, without understanding that that would be completely politically infeasible. Um, and so the initial reaction is usually fairly negative and donors are often worried about commissioning political economy analyses that might sort of anger their partners, but at the same time, there is benefits on both sides for more politically smart programming. Oh, Tom's so just going to so conclude quickly. Yeah, thanks, Dan. Let me just wrap up. <coughs> Why is this so hard? In a certain way, when you explain this to people and you work with practitioners, there's a strong feeling that this is obvious. Of course we should do these things. Of course one should be politically smart in one's development. Of course, you know, we have to have a larger vision of political goals together with socioeconomic ones. Yet 20 to 25 years into this, movement, it's very partial. I mean, the book, we called it the almost revolution. We debated about not just whether almost is an adjective or not, but also about um, what the adjective should be. Um, and it's it's incomplete. <coughs> it's, it's a generation or two generations of work on this, but it's fallen short in many ways, which I won't detail, but Deanne described some of the conflict. Why is this so hard? Well, it's hard for a couple of reasons. First, because 
Development assistance, as I started by mentioning, still you know is a product of a larger relationship of governments to to other governments and to other societies, and is constantly cut down by other interests and distracted. I mean, the extraordinarily vivid example last week in the news and the U.S. press of the United States government is on the one hand promoting governance reform in Afghanistan and the rule of law with a number of Afghan actors, yet at the same time delivering bags of cash to the Afghan president. Um, that's completely unaccountable and both in the U.S. government and within the Afghan government. And so development assistance is, you know, fairly seriously trying to work on this problem of governance and rule of law of Afghanistan, Afghanistan on the one hand, but another part of the larger policy establishment is doing something the opposite. Okay, that happens in some dramatic or notable cases like that, but that's not always a problem. A problem that does pervade the community still is um, the fact that there is an ongoing empirical scholarly debate about whether the, quote, Western model of governance, however one defines it, narrowly or broadly, how much it really contributes to good socioeconomic outcomes. And we have a whole chapter devoted to what we call the unresolved debate. Mm -hmm. You have an orthodoxy which says it is, it must be. In Asimoglu and Robbins' important book, you know, uh, Why Nations Fail, is for the believers in the orthodoxy, happy news. Here's a book that says it's effective, inclusive institutions that account for the success of, of, of many societies. Yet, the book is controversial, not controversial, but the book is contested by many who say there, there are alternative explanations. And there are other schools of thought, those who look at China and say, really, isn't it developmental states, which may not be the same as Western-style governance? And that debate goes all the way back to the 1960s, the same debate we've been having for 50 years back in the 1960s. You can find people arguing about authoritarian development versus more participatory development and so forth. It's still deeply unresolved. And within mainstream aid organizations, when you scratch up to the middle and senior levels, you find a lot of mainstream economists who deep down don't buy the empirical argument for embracing a political governance agenda. And when they're you know, quietly among themselves or with you and are willing to say what they really think, they say, we just deep down don't really buy this. <coughs> and so that's still a, a very big issue, and we go into that in some detail. Third. The trends in the aid, aid world, on the one hand, are towards this, but other trends in the aid world cut directly against it. <coughs> uh, for example, uh, the pressure that all mainstream aid providers feel to value for money, do more with less, prove your results, prove impact, this works in many ways against more politically sort of agile and smart methods, in some cases political goals, because doing more with less means you have a lot fewer staff proportionate to the amount of assistance you're giving. But as we look at politically smart assistance is labor intensive. You have to do political analysis. You have to have more people on the ground. You have to be willing to work in partnership with more local actors that might be different kind of cost structure. And yet the doing more with less reduces the aid community more and more to being constrained in terms of its, its resources it can bring to these problems. <coughs> Similarly, the results pressure, which is really just like a fever in donor capitals. I mean, whether you go to Stockholm or Ottawa or Brussels or London or Washington, you know, there's a results, you know, there's an intense results pressure that aid organizations are feeling. And thus, there's a tremendous value being placed on more definite, sometimes quasi-scientific, sometimes scientific methods for assessing results. Double-blind testing, randomized control trials and other things, which if misused, can really constrain your flexibility and thoughtfulness in your assistance work. It makes, makes it harder to define wider goals, like what is a good legislature as opposed to, um, you know, what is a vaccination program that reaches these five villages. And so goals and on methods, can you have the kind of flexibility needed in a randomized control trial type program to change your goal halfway through if you learned that, you know, adverse circumstances. And we have a section where we talk about is the this new results pressure going to deform the very insights or prohibit the very insights we've arrived at after all these years. And then the fourth reason this is difficult <coughs> is that the larger international context for assistance has changed fundamentally. Remember that this whole drive towards politics and development grew out of a very positive post-Cold War environment of self-confidence about the Western political economic model, a feeling of no real competitors in the developer fe developing field, sort of like it's us or nobody. And also more political space. End of the Cold War rivalry. You could go to another government and say, you know, we're picking on you over there in Malawi, not because we're, you know, worried about your ties to the Soviet Union, because we just think you're governing yourselves badly. More freedom for, for, <coughs> for that. All of that's changing uh, today. Obviously, I don't need to say that, you know, Western confidence in our own economic and political model is not what it used to be, and it doesn't command any immediate respect anywhere in the developing world, and certainly in question. 
there are competitors out there in the development world who offer other models. And, you know, obviously people talk about Chinese aid, but it's not just China. Korea is becoming an active donor in many ways. Japan has always been an active donor, but is still a very large player and others who have a very different view of these things. And uh, the field is much more competitive. And then thirdly, the political space for this assistance, at the very moment in a sense that we've realized we really do need to be political, <coughs> many governments are saying, yeah, we've sort of figured out what you mean by that and we don't like it. <coughs> and so last week, for example, the president of Bolivia in a May Day speech announced that I'm gonna close down US assistance in this country once and for all to loud cheers, programs being closed down. You know, it was hundreds of millions of dollars of health work, education, literacy, agriculture works being closed down because he says assistance has become too political. I don't want this anymore in the country. And so at the very moment, donors think, oh, we have the answer. We're going to be really political. Um, countries are saying, yeah, yeah, goodbye. Uh, and so there's a, something is, in a sense, a bit of a drama at the end of the book in, is that it's taken us 20 years to get our act together, both intellectually and practically, to embrace this agenda. But at the very moment, internationally, where the ground for it is much weaker than it once was. So it's only almost a revolution. Yeah. <coughs>